All right, welcome. Uh, I'm Ryan Holger with uh, Temperature Equipment Corporation. Today with me, we have Sal Stangerone, uh, Kevin, and uh, Craig joining us. We are doing this in partnership with Chicagoland Better Heating Cooling Council, CBHCC, which is a really long acronym. Uh, we were supposed to do this as a live training uh, with that group, um, with you guys, uh, but that obviously got canceled because of everything that's going on. So we're doing it as a web version instead. It'll be slightly shorter, although it is still gonna be three hours long. We will take a break about halfway through so everybody can uh, hit the restroom, get a can of beer, whatever you gotta do. Um, but right now we're gonna start off with uh, Sal presenting and I'm gonna turn everything over to him. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, hopefully you will all have some questions, so feel free to type them in at any point um, and we'll try to address them as they come in. But otherwise, um, like Ryan said, we're gonna get into some applications about VRF, how it works, some of the product, and then towards the, in the second half, we'll get into the install good practices, service, all of that. So with that, let's get started. Okay. VRF, for, for any of you who do not know VRF, um, stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow, right, where we are varying the amount of refrigerant from the outdoor unit to the indoor units based on the requirements. Um, so why should we use VRF? Um, in our market, you know, VRF has some good and bad um, opinions, uh, or, or uh, yeah, op opinions. But um, why we want to use VRF um, in many applications is because it's very efficient, right? When you have an inverter compressor and you're modulating that compressor, you are acting very efficiently, right? It's a lot, it's gonna save you a lot of money compared to just an on-off compressor. Um, also, you do have the ability to do individual zone control, right? Similar to like a VAV zoning system or VVT zoning system. On the air side, you have an individual zone um, for all of your areas, right? So that gives an increase in comfort for your customer. Um, because you have an inverter compressor on the outdoor unit and you have ECM motors on your inside fan coils or air handlers, you have very quiet operation, which is again, another benefit for your end users. Sound is important. Um, the maintenance, because it's all piping and refrigerant, there's very little airflow. Um, relative to some air systems, HVAC systems, there is low maintenance small, easy filters that need to be changed. Um, and because there are a couple different ways you can do VRF, which we're gonna talk about, you have some flexibility on the piping of how you're gonna install it, right? So depending on what type of building you have, you may be able to use different types of variable refrigerant flow um, to make it optimal based on the piping that you need. So there's two main types of variable refrigerant flow, and we call them heat pump and heat recovery. So first we're gonna talk about heat pump, okay? Heat pump meaning it can do both heating and cooling with refrigerant through your compressors, similar to a standard residential heat pump, okay? However, we're using an inverter and we're varying the flow. Um, but the big difference between heat pump and heat recovery from what you're gonna see is, in a heat pump system, you can only operate in one mode at one time. So you can either do all cooling or all heating. So if we look at this picture, our system is in cooling, we have cold air coming out of all these units, it's possible that one or two of these may not want cooling at this time, but they do not have the choice to provide heating in this case in a heat pump system, okay? So when to use a heat pump system, sorry, we'll go back, um, is when you want, when you have areas you're feeding that are all similar loads, right? If you have two different areas that have very different load profiles, maybe one's on the east side of the building, one's on the west side of the building, where you're possibly gonna have sun load in the morning on one side and not on the other. It's not a good application for a heat pump VRF system, right? Because if you have one area that wants cooling and one wants heating, your system's gonna have to continually switch back and forth between the two modes, and that's not efficient and that's not good for your comfort, okay? So when you have those applications, you wanna go to heat recovery. So heat recovery, Works similar, heating and cooling through refrigerant, through a compressor, but now you have the ability to provide either heating or cooling at the same time based on your zones. 
Okay, so there's a couple different ways you can pipe VRF systems, um, and different manufacturers do it different ways. All right, so the first one, what you'll see on the left here, is called two pipe heat recovery. Okay, and essentially what that means is we have two pipes coming from our outdoor unit to our flow selector, this box right here, and then this flow selector has two pipes going to all of the indoor units. And the way this works is each of the indoor units determines if it wants heating or cooling, sends that information back to the flow selector, then whatever the majority is tells the outdoor unit to go into that mode. So if the majority wants cooling, our outdoor unit goes into cooling. And then this flow selector box determines what to do with the refrigerant. So it has cold refrigerant coming from my outdoor unit. It's gonna then send it off to the indoor units that want it. And then when those indoor units that use the cold refrigerant send back their hot refrigerant, rather than sending that back to the outdoor unit to release into the atmosphere, it, this flow selector actually sends that hot refrigerant to the zones that need heating. So that's how a heat recovery system actually has the ability to do simultaneous heating and cooling. You're essentially moving the heat from the areas that need cooling to the areas that need heating through refrigerant. So it's a very efficient, very cool way um, to control and heat and cool a space. Um, but again, that's only with heat recovery. In the heat pump type application, all of these zones would have to be in cooling mode. You wouldn't have the option. So summing up, in two pipe, outdoor unit, you have two pipes coming into the building, into the flow selector. In three pipe heat recovery, now we have three pipes coming from our outdoor unit into our flow selectors. And what you guys, we haven't talked about yet, which we will, is these flow selector boxes, also called branch selectors, branch collectors, um, are available in different sizes. So you can have individual flow selectors, meaning each indoor fan coil has its own flow selector that determines if it needs heating or cooling. Also, you can have multi-ports similar to this large one right, where you have four tapped off of each of these or six tapped off or eight, okay? So those different flow selector sizes really help out when you're doing an installation um, because this large flow selector on a two pipe may not, it may not be easy to put that in a building, right? Maybe if you're doing a, a school or something where you have a hallway of, of, of classrooms and in that hallway above the ceiling, you can mount this large box. But if you don't have that ability, um, you have these individual ones that you can mount above the ceiling to make it easier for you on your installation. Okay, so heat pipe, sorry, three pipe heat recovery. You have different options of flow selectors. In two pipe, you have smaller options as well, but the big difference is you have three pipes coming from the outdoor unit, and two pipe, you have two. For a heat pump system, you're only going to have two pipes coming from your outdoor unit to all your indoor units and you are not gonna have the flow selectors. Because you only have one option of running heating or cooling, um, you do not need those individual flow selectors to determine what the individual indoor units need. We have a question, Ryan? No questions yet. Okay, sorry, I thought I saw, I thought I saw it flashing. Okay, heat pump systems. So, sorry, I'm getting a delay here. Components. So we have our outdoor unit, condensing unit with your with our compressors, indoor unit, and our controller. Very simple, not a lot of moving parts, right? And here's just an example of the piping, indoor unit, different model options that you'll see. We'll go through all the different models of what's available. They're all very similar through different manufacturers, but you have your two pipes coming from your outdoor unit. We have these Y joints that are essentially letting you tap each indoor unit into the main run, similar to a daisy chain type um, connection with wiring. Um, and then all of your indoor units have individual controllers or thermostats that are reading the space temperature and sending that information. So wiring wise, um, which we don't have a slide to show, but all of your thermostats get wired to our indoor units, and then our indoor units get daisy chain wired to the outdoor unit. So these all get tied together similar on the piping side with the wire. So luckily you can run the wire with the pipe um, if it's easier for you. So applications, we mentioned heat pump, 
you need to have similar load profiles. Okay, so if you're doing a large space like a lobby or a gym, some area where you're gonna have similar temperature spreads, right? Um, very good for heat pump, right? We could take this gym and we can put a couple different units on the different walls that are all feeding and all operating the same mode, okay? Same with a lobby. Churches, if you have the big, um, <clears throat> your, your hall or your, uh, where you're holding mass or your service, um, similar type profile in those spaces, good for heat pump. For heat recovery, similar components, except for adding that flow selector like we talked about, right? And you'll see there's a couple different options, which we'll get into more. Um, but si similar indoors, similar outdoors, similar controls, and on the installation side, it's similar piping. Um, however, you have a lot more applications you can work with now. So schools, classrooms, offices, right, assisted living, right, where you have some areas that may not be occupied and others are, where you may not need the, you're not going to have the same load, um, great locations to use heat recovery. The way I look at it, if I'm, you know, I'm used to the air side, the heat pump system is like a VVT system, right, where it's all call, one call. Heat recovery is like a VAB system with reheat, where your VABs can choose if you have heating or cooling, whichever one you prefer. So heat recovery is a better option for comfort. Heat pump will still work well if it's designed right. Um, it's just a more economical way to do it. Okay, we're gonna talk about the product just so we get an idea of all the different components, what they look like, what options we have. Um, as you'll see, there are a number of different indoor units that can be tied back to an outdoor VRF system or condensing unit. Um, and you're gonna see these models are gonna continue to expand, right? When you're using an inverter compressor, you're operating very efficiently. Um, so you're gonna see there's gonna be more and more of your standard HVAC equipment getting tied into these outdoor units because the system is so efficient, right? So we have air handlers, cassettes, high walls, recessed cabinet heater types, ducted units, a number of different options of what you can tie in. Um, one thing to note, I'm just going to show you a couple pictures of outdoor units. So it's very common through a number of manufacturers for your outdoor units when you're getting larger sizes to essentially twin them together. Okay, so these are heat pump units. You have a single chassis, now you're tying in two together and you're tying in three together to get your maximum capacity out of them. Um, so what you'll see is if you tie three together in a triple module like this, you can get up to 38 tons all tied to one system. It's a very large system. Um, one thing to note when you're doing this, and again, it's very common, um, you need separate power connections for each individual module and separate piping connections get connected to each of them. So it's nice you have redundancy. If you lose a module, you still have two that, out, that will operate, um, but there's a little bit more involved on the installation side. So these are just different, yes. Uh -huh. So a couple things on this slide as well. I want to just note that uh, if you look on the single module, it's 14 tons. Sal's going to get into it. As far as voltages go, three-phase and single-phase modules, 14 tons is a pretty large system. So we are seeing this more in larger homes uh, with bigger expansion to give them, uh, you know, single zone heating or cooling with the heat recovery. But I will say a house is a very good application being that, I mean, how many people have the house that the whole place is gonna need heating and cooling in separate rooms? This is a very good application for it. And we'll show you the floor print here in a minute for the space savers as well. Thank you. So these are heat pumps. What you'll see is they look very similar to the heat recovery units. Um, one thing I wanted to quick note is for smaller tonnages, three, four, and five tons, we actually have a VRF type unit. Um, so the difference between this and your normal duckless, um, duck-free splits that you see or mini splits is that you can get very long line lengths off of these and you can get more units, right? So on the five ton, you can actually get nine indoor units off of it. Normally with a five ton mini split, you're only gonna get up to five. So you have a little bit of flexibility in between this six ton here. Um, and if you have like a long line length, like a high rise or something where you need to be up on the roof and you're, you're coming down. Um, so you have a little bit more flexibility with this in between. So this is only available in heat pump. This is not heat recovery. 
That's kind of our mini series. Um, hey, on the heat recovery side, Sal? sorry, a question? Yes, we did have a question from Bazal. Uh, he wants to know what the maximum number of zones that can be connected to a selector. To a selector, okay. It's coming Good up. Question. Let's see if we could yeah. show a selector. Mm -hmm. So um, depends on the selector that you have. So you can, I, I believe our selector, what you'll see is the maximum is, is eight that would be able to choose what mode of operation you want. However, you can actually tag a couple, multiple zones off of the same port of the selector. They would just operate in heat pump mode where they would have to be in the same mode at the same time. So it's kind of hard to explain what I'm saying here. So this one has four ports on it right now. So you could have four indoor units that would all have their individual control. Um, however, I can take four indoor units off of this one line here and they, they're all going to have to operate in the same mode, but that can actually give me up to 16 units off of this one flow selector. And then obviously Hopefully that makes sense. We could uh, talk a little on bit the more tonnage about of the, uh, Based on the tonnage of the indoor units, we could have a heat recovery with a office of six in a large conference room that may need for three units. So instead of having the pipe to each one of those, we could take one branch off of that and run all four units off of that one circuit. So we would still have seven available based on the tonnage of the indoor matched up correctly to give you what you want. Similar to that, if that makes sense. Up to four, continuing on. That is some mad artistic skills you have there, so. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. You don't have a stylus? <laughs> oh, that that stays on there, huh? Oh, no, I'm the, you got to click, click the clear thing. The same place you <laughs> click, 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 pick clear. Got it. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no yeah. Sal, so, just to clarify something. Um, so you had a picture of that the flow selector just prior that you were. Mm -hmm. So that is a picture of a four port flow selector. So the max that you could hang off of that liquid and suction is five tons. So as long as you have the outdoor unit capacity to back it up, you can do it. But the max is five tons. And the max number of units per port is four, I believe. Yeah, you can run it up. It's really don't see it all that much. All, I've maybe seen two for like a, a larger conference area. But yes, you can go up to four. We have a question from Rishi. Uh, Rishi's asking, is there a capacity size on the selector? Meaning, do you have multiple uh, models there's a max selector with different BTU capacities? I believe that there's one coming up showing the flow selectors. Yeah, we're gonna talk more about flow selectors, so if we could hold that one until we get to them, I think that would maybe clarify a few things. More questions? We're good for right now on the questions. Okay. Okay, so heat recovery, similar modules look very similar. Um, you cannot mix and match them. They are different internally. Um, so if you know you mistakenly get a heat pump unit and you're trying to use it as a heat recovery, just because they look the same, they are not the same. Um, we'll talk about, they do have two individual rotary inverter compressors. We'll talk about some of the benefits to that. But again, similar module setup where you're going to have to pipe and wire to the individual modules. Similar sizing, up to 38 tons, down to six tons. And like Greg was saying, we do have a six ton and a 12 ton in single phase heat recovery. Okay, most of the time you'll see single phase heat pump where you have one mode of operation. Um, but with this six, six ton or 12 ton heat recovery for large homes, um, you now have the ability to do an application where if it's zero degrees outside but you're having a big party in your home and it gets pretty hot in there you don't have to open up a window you can actually heat the spaces that aren't being used in the house and then cool the space where you have a number of people um, so it's kind of a, a very very high-end comfort application for um, a larger home where you have six tons or even 12 tons with a single phase we do have it available in three phase as well um, for commercial applications. Okay, so just a, ge a general layout here of a heat recovery type application. 
So we have our outdoor unit. Here's our, our green is our wire that we talked about, daisy chaining the units together. And our three pipes coming from our outdoor unit, we have an individual flow selector for our cassettes. And then we have a multi-port um, where we have four individual cassettes off of this one. So in this case, kind of what we were describing before, we can twin up to four cassettes off of this flow selector, but these all can only operate in the same mode right, because we have our flow selector that determines what refrigerant's getting brought to these, they can either get heating or cooling all at once, right, whereas these can individually say, I want heating, I want cooling, I want heating, I want cooling. Okay, um, we're viewing just the indoor units, um, a number of different sizes for your application, and again, you're gonna see this continue to expand. Um, Carrier does actually have a rooftop unit now that can tie into a VRF outdoor unit. Um, so it does not even have a condenser coil at all. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the benefits, but something to be aware of, you're gonna see it more and more. There are manufacturers that have unit vents, um, again, because of the efficiencies with the refrigerant, um, you're going to have, you're going to see more and more of these indoor units that are going to be compatible. So this rooftop unit that Carrier released, available three, four, and five tons, no condenser coil, so it's a lot lighter, right? Available in 208 single phase or 460 single phase. There's no three phase option for it. Um, you do have an ECM motor with three speeds, a good amount of external static, um, standard warranty, all of that. But it will also fit on existing carrier rooftop curves. So if you're looking at doing a retrofit of a building where you have some rooftops and some maybe fan coils or um, individual split systems and you want to put it all on one system together, um, you do have some flexibility where you can pop these rooftops on the existing curves of those carrier rooftops. So kind of a cool thing. Um, but as you can see, just compatible with heat pump or heat recovery, still need a flow selector, um, but you can mix and match. They can all, you can have multiple units off of the outdoor unit. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one type application. So just some advantages, right? They're lighter because they don't have the condenser coil. Could be beneficial for the structural. Same curb footprint, good static. Um, it is available to do economizer control. Um, so you can do cooling through economizer rather than um, the VRF cooling. And you can bring some outdoor air through the unit, okay, um, for ventilation. Now, says up to 30%, this depends on your area. In Chicago, that 30% outside air is a little high when we get some extreme temperatures. Um, but you do, you could possibly downsize your DOAS unit, because every VRF system requires ventilation in a commercial application. You do need a dedicated outdoor air unit with VRF. You can possibly downsize it by bringing in some of that air through your rooftop unit. Um, but it was just something you would want to confirm when you're designing a project or working on a project, how much of that outside air you can bring through to be sure. Um, another benefit that's not, not as thought about as much is you can actually keep all the refrigerant on the roof, right? You do not need to put refrigerant piping in the space. You know, there is potential for refrigerant leaks, right? You don't want refrigerant in your space. ECM direct drive motors. Um, so a lot of benefits to doing it. it. It doesn't fit every application, but it's something to think about that we do have available for you guys. Okay, let's talk about the flow selectors. So we do have different sizes. Um, so these are just our single ports, right? So there's different models based on how many, how many BTUs it can handle and how many indoor units it can handle. So I was mistaken. You can do more than that, correct, Kevin? Just depends on BTU capacity. Yep, up to eight off of each port. Uh, right. But like I said, Sal, you really don't run into that application all that often, but it's there. Correct. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna, you have five ton kick capacity in here, and you're gonna have eight indoor units. That's a lot of small zones. Um, one of the benefits to these single port flow selectors that you, that kind of gets overlooked a lot is this is about the size of a toaster. So it is very easy to put above the ceiling. Um, you know, you don't need a lot of space or clearance for it. And it's powered off of the indoor unit. 
So on VRF systems, all of the indoor units need their own power feeds. Um, when you're using larger flow selectors, multi-ports, that flow selector needs a power feed. With these single ports, these actually get tied into the indoor unit where that the power from the indoor can actually feed this. So you may save some installation costs from the electrician when using them. I'm going to chime in on this, guys. Uh, obviously, we know uh, the city of Chicago, uh, the codes that are there, pretty much everything has to be in conduit. A lot of applications for VRF as far as this box uh, is free aired. The box that is the single port has two cables, uh, five wire for communication and a two wire for 208, 230 single voltage. That pull wire in city of Chicago, wherever the local electrical code is that you're installing this in, needs to be confirmed that you know, it can be free aired. If not, we need to make sure that the pipes either size larger or we need to be called to discuss about what the other option is. Okay, this single port box, as Sal's discussed, is only a 50 footer. The long pipe flow box has neither of any plugs. So it may be a better option or install in certain areas where nothing can be free aired. This will have to have two wires from a power source brought to it, whether conduit, a whip, or wherever it's located. So when we're thinking about installs and we're thinking about time or you know what's going to be the best scenario, even though we're within 50 feet, the long pipe flow box may be better for your application because you can't use the cable for the smaller box. Awesome, thank you, Greg. So um, we do have some larger boxes as well with multiple ports, right? So this is a four port and a six port. Um, again, need separate power source. Kevin, you, you don't know the capacities of these off the top of your head, do you? Four, what you said was five tons, how much is a six? 61,000, so that's, 61,000. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Wow, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, no problem. Five tons on both of them. I apologize. Okay, so let's talk some of the uh, benefits no, let me, of... So, let me ask a couple of questions yes. before we go on to the next section. Uh, and regarding the rooftop, uh, Rishi asks if we can add electric heat to the rooftop in addition to the VRF heating. Yes, definitely. Preheat and or reheat. Work. Right. Yes, that... An external duct heater, but the, the the rooftop can be ordered with heating, electric, or gas. You get Not a heat, you get a so VRF electric. application with the rooftop. Hang, hang on, don't... hang on, hang on. You guys are saying different things. You can get it with electric heat in the rooftop. You can get it with electric heat in the duct, but you cannot get it with gas heat. Is that correct? Correct. Got it. All right. Uh, Rishi uh, has another question. When you have multiple units per single port unit, does it matter which one of the indoor units is used to power it? Well, if we're in a day, uh, it just has we have four units in one room. One of those units is going to be determined to be the leader. The others are the follower. The one box with the flow selector, if we're using a heat recovery, is basically going to be all four in that room off the one port we're going to be in the same mode okay so we're not going to have an application unless we have two separate circuits which i don't know why we'd have a room with that with four units and two separate pipes one room one zone multiple heads off of one flow selector would be the design and the application if the tonnage and the btus allow it for the design Okay, and then the flow it, does, it does not matter which which indoor unit powers it. Okay. Any of them can power it. All right, the answer is then it doesn't matter which one. Just pick any one of the units. Got Correct. It. That okay. one would become the the master essentially. Got it. All right, I think we're good on the questions. Thanks, guys. Okay, so one of the benefits of having two inverter compressors in each of our modules is you get a lot of redundancy. Right, so each of these compressors has the ability to ramp up, right? It's not a single inverter and a single stage, right? So if you lose one compressor, you're not losing your whole unit, 
you lose 50% capacity, but you can still modulate from 50 down to the minimum, all right? And then when you're losing an entire module, you can lose a module, but you're still gonna run, in this case, at two-thirds capacity with full modulation from minimum to two-thirds capacity, right? So if you have a failure, right, when you have all these indoor units tied off of an outdoor unit, when the outdoor unit fails, your indoor units go down, you have the ability to lock out an individual compressor and still run. You have the ability to lock out an individual module and still run. So yes, if it happens and you fail, you will be down, but you can get back up very quickly at a lower capacity until you can replace or fix the problem with the compressor. This is just talking about how the compressors modulate together, right? We are not modulating one up turning the other one on full blast and then modulating it down. We are modulating one up to approximately 80%. Once we get there, then we start modulating the other one up and we try to optimize efficiency between this 30 and 80% range because that is the most efficient for the compressor. Okay, a couple other benefits of this product. Um, so each indoor unit has what's called a pulse motor valve. This is similar to a TXV in that it's regulating how much refrigerant is delivered through the unit. Um, so this pulse motor valve on the Toshiba Carrier product can actually fully close, meaning you can have an indoor unit where you have zero refrigerant going through it. Um, and that's a big deal because there are a lot of manufacturers and a lot of products, even on the residential, the lower tonnage size, where this valve does not fully close and you're leaking refrigerant through that indoor unit. So a couple benefits of that are, one, it's not efficient, right? You're leaking refrigerant through this. Compressor has to work a little bit harder for that leakage. But two, you do not have what's called cold blow or hot blow. Okay, so what that means is when I have refrigerant coming through my unit, my unit either has to shut the fan off so that I don't deliver any of that hot or cold air to the space if I don't want it. But a lot of times in a commercial space, you have to run that fan in order to ventilate if you're bringing your, doubt, your outside air through that unit. Um, because we can close off that refrigerator completely, we are not gonna have any of that hot or cold blow into the space where you're sitting and you're hot and you're not getting hot air blown on you because other areas of the VROP system are in heating. So it's a very nice finish. feature to the fully. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. Go ahead and finish, sir. I apologize. No, I'm good. Go ahead. So as VRF goes, occupied space, unless the thermostat is off and the thermostat is on, that fan runs everywhere. Okay, so we get a lot of calls and a lot of not necessarily complaints, but other systems and other manufacturers about it blows cold and I'm not looking for cold or it's always hot over here and it's not. And that's because we don't have 100% shut off. But if the unit is on, the fan runs all the time unless it's an alarm or we're in no cold blow or a warm up period to where the indoor coil is going to get a proper temperature before the fan turns on. So you don't have that mild or lukewarm blowing on you until we're actually to the temperature that we want to be running the air over the indoor coil for. These units from the factory when shipped come with that EXV fully open, which means as far as the install part of this goes, nitrogen brazing and any kind of pressurization or making sure that everything has flow through it Okay, is why that is. We'll talk more about charging and best practices in the second half, but good to know. Okay, another cool part about these inverter rotary compressors is the staging. So our inverter compressors can actually stage in increments of 0.1 hertz, okay? So that 0.1 hertz gives you a ton of stage capacity, right? When you're looking between five and one hertz here, all of these red dots are individual stages that you can run on this unit. So that inverter com control gives you way better control of refrigerant, way better comfort, because you're delivering the exact refrigerant you need, and way better efficiency. So 
So these inverter rotary compressors are very great compressors. We have not had a lot of failures with them and their ability to stage like that and having two of them really increases the comfort and efficiency for your system. Okay, we'll talk about the controls. We talked a little bit about the indoors and the outdoors. Now we'll talk about controls, thermostats, interface systems, and BAS systems. So the most common control you're gonna see on these indoor units is our remote controller. Um, it's available programmable or unprogrammable, but essentially this is your thermostat. Um, so a number of features, adjust the set point, fan speed, mode of operation. You can lock them out all adjustable, pretty standard. Um, no Wi-Fi built into them, unfortunately. Then you can look at a simple wired remote where this is very basic, hotter, colder, on off, um, not programmable, or you can even look at just a temperature sensor. If you don't want anyone locally in the zone to be able to adjust um, the set point or the, set the system on or off, you can just put a button sensor or some sort of wall plate sensor on that will function, right? So a little bit of flexibility there. You can do the standard wireless remote. Um, everyone familiar with ductless and mini splits, wireless is the standard option on a lot of the products. Um, with our product standard, we're doing the wired controller, the remote control that we showed in the first option. But if you want a wireless handheld, you have the ability to get it. Um, We'll come back to that. But last thing for the indoor control is the 24 volt interface. So if the customer wants Wi-Fi thermostat for each of the indoor units, right? they like the Ecobees, you have the ability to do it. You have to buy the 24 volt interface and then you can wire any standard heating and cooling thermostat single stage to this. So you do not need a heat pump thermostat, even though it operates as a heat pump. And you do not lose the inverter modulation control with this 24 volt interface. So you're gonna call for Y1 for cooling and your unit is going to, because it has a sensor built in a supply and return air temperature sensor, it's still going to modulate itself um, based on what you need, both the fan and the refrigerant from that pulse modulation valve. So you're not losing any efficiency by switching to this 24 volt interface. It's just an additional cost that you're gonna have um, in addition to the thermostat. That's also a uh, powered unit that has to be filled and installed with a separate transformer that cannot be powered off of our unit that has to have its own individual power for install reasons. I'll say something else about this slide as well if you go back. Uh, you see mm -hmm. at the bottom, uh, we have a lot of these where uh, the Echo B, the Nest want to be used. Uh, the thermostat for the product here, as it shows in the schematic, can also be left in the unit for troubleshooting purposes. I'll go ahead and talk about it now if you don't mind. The product staff wall controller, as we call it, has the ability to give alarms, to give codes, to give you information that will not be available on a third-party thermostat. So as you see on the wiring schematic, number one, this is gonna be the application, the service tech or the person needs to have this for troubleshooting abilities, or if it's a later change and they want to have a third-party thermostat, there's no reason we can't leave this in the unit to use it as a troubleshooting device. You don't see two thermostats on anything very often, but in this situation we can. Awesome, thank you, Greg. So if you do, if you do leave the regular communicating thermostat inside the unit, it would then presumably ignore the set point on there, or you have to tell it to ignore the set point on there. As long as it's set up as the follower remote control, we'll get into the codes here in a minute. But I just wanted to clear up the schematic if anybody was confused. Okay, and then correct. Yeah, it's going to ignore any it. Benefits to using a third-party stat at all, other than someone's personal aesthetics preference. Uh, I'll just uh, chime in on this. If we have an office of 10, does, do we need 10 Nest thermostats so everybody can, you know, have their office room nice and warm or cold when they come in? Uh, guys, I see this more of a, like we talked about, the single phase or more of a larger house application if, you know, that's what's needed. But people are creatures of habit. That Nest thermostat is their life. It's on their phone. It's been set up. And if something changes, it could be 
you know, oh God, it all breaks, you know, loose and everybody's worried. We can still use both, whether it's in the unit as the factory staff or whether the service tech has it in their van. All that has to be done is it hooked up on that bus and we're right back in business with anything wrong with that system. So from a service standpoint, you always want to have a stat that's factory if we're going to use the third party application. Cool. Thanks, Greg. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, the slide that we flipped over is uh, we do have a controller that you can use to enable an ERV. So if you're using an energy recovery ventilator as your outside air, uh, your ventilation air, um, or you want to interlock to a dedicated outdoor air unit so that whenever the VRF is on, the ventilation is on, um, you have the ability to do that through this external controller. This is only an on-off, correct? Yeah, but it'll it'll know when the units are occupied or not, and if they have to. That's correct. You know. Right. Yeah. So from a VAS standpoint, on that, as far as reporting or anything, it would we would have to use an upper level controller, correct? Say it again. I'm sorry. I didn't understand. So as far as if a VAS is looking for points or to pull anything off of that ERV from this box, that yeah, there's no feedback. Okay. There's no feedback, it's just telling it when to run. Correct. Yes, yeah, Sal, I'd like to clarify something with this. Um, guys, this controller, it essentially has a standard thermostat style interface, okay? So it's gonna tell the fan to turn on in the ERV and it's gonna tell it to turn off, okay? You can also use that thermostat or that wall controller that Sal had up on previous slides before, just our typical wall controller that can be programmable. So yes, that controller is tied in with that ERV controller. So you can essentially program that ERV for unoccupied and occupied times. Awesome. Okay, last controller we wanna talk about uh, before we get into the BAS interfaces is the DX kit. Okay, so um, a lot of manufacturers, like we said, the indoor units are going to keep adjusting. So now they're releasing, they call a DX controller or DX kit. And essentially what this is, is a controller that will allow you to control a DX coil on an air handler. Okay, so you have two different operations of how you want to control it. You can control it off of return air temperature or off of supply air temperature. So you can maintain a return air set point or maintain a discharge air set point. Um, and this guy wires back to your outdoor unit to give you that variable refrigerant flow to that air handler. So if your customer has an existing air handler or has a dedicated outdoor air hand handling unit that has a DX coil, you may have the ability, depending on the sizing, to tie in a VRF outdoor unit to that um, and, and take advantage of that inverter control um, and that high efficiency on the outdoor unit. Um, so, like everything we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about, we are more than happy to help you guys in any sort of design application that you have. Um, but when you get involved with this, it's a little bit more involved design-wise because we need to know the exact design of the coil that you have, the airflow. There's a lot of information we need to make sure we can select both this unit and the outdoor unit for you. Um, it's not as simple as saying, hey, I have a 10-ton DX coil. Um, we, need to, we need a little bit more information to do that. But it is an option. Applications uh, for this that I've seen are uh, businesses that run from six to six. One of their tenants is an after hour company, but the building's rooftop air handler, space air handler has VAV boxes or fan powered boxes. If it's set up correctly, we can put a DX coil on that fan powered box to give you control at after hours for. DX cooling, heating, whatever the application may be with this. Okay, um, interfaces. So for your building engineer, for your end user, um, we have a nice touch screen interface, right? Where you can see all of the individual indoor units. You can enable them, adjust the on off, the fan mode, the heat cool mode, the set point, the schedule, all from a nice touch screen. This is available to connect to the web, so you can web and in, remote into it 
Um, however, it's not a wireless connection, so you actually have to hardwire for the web connection, but you can pull it up on a computer screen as well. <clears throat> and then we do have a BACnet interface. So for any building automation system, we can add this accessory, you can tie into a BAS system um, and give the BAS the ability to adjust the modes, set points, fan speeds, louvers, and prohibit um, occupied signals or um, local control for each of the indoor units through the BAS. Um, so you don't get full information on VRF systems through the BAS. All right, you're not getting refrigerant pressures or any of that information, but the control of all the indoor units, you can actually take good control of them and do them um, from your building automation system. And we do have an option to seamlessly integrate into the carrier building automation system, which is called iView. So um, with this previous one here, obviously the building automation guy is gonna have to manually create all of his points and graphics and all of his integration information like any building automation system would. Um, but for the carrier eye view, um, this panel can tie directly into it and it auto discovers all the information. So graphics and points are all pulled in. Um, so integrating that type of system is, you know, less than an hour versus the number of hours it would take to build all the third party stuff. So very seamless using that product. Okay, so big differences that we covered, big um, benefits of the product and things to look for um, when you're talking VRF. So the single phase heat recovery for larger end homes is a cool thing to be able to offer, right? Where you can do heating and cooling at the same time. There's not a lot of homes that are able to do that residentially. You remember the pulse module valve for the indoor units where we can actually shut off the refrigerant going into the indoor units. That is a big deal. Um, that compressor modulation down to 0.1 hertz increments gives you way better control. Um, and then on the install side with that indoor unit, you can just wire the power directly from the indoor to the flow selector. So you save that electrical connection um, from your electrician. So a number of benefits. Um, you know, when talking about any VRF system, right, there are certain things you want to look at and be aware of, right? I would say make sure if your your refrigerant valve is not closing all the way, you make your customer aware that, hey, if you're not calling for something, you may feel some hot or cold air, right? It's just, just be aware of it. Make sure if you're designing a heat pump system, the customer knows that you cannot do heating and cooling at the same time, right? They need to know that. It's okay to do, but they need to be aware of it, right? Um, any questions? Hey, so I wanted to add one more item um, on the on the single port flow selector. Uh, you mentioned that yeah, it can be powered from its fan coil, I guess, that it's serving. Mm -hmm. Another important thing to note with the single port is that it does not need a condensate line. It is 100% sealed. So, with the larger flow selectors, they do require a condensate line, but with the single ports, no condensate line, which could yeah, be so, a in some cases. Yeah, so any multi-port, thank you, Kevin, has to be powered separately, own dedicated service, as well as it has to have a condensate line attached to it, because it's a multi-port box, it will get obviously sweating happening, so we're gonna have condensation. So those are two things. Okay, Ryan, we have any questions on product design applications? No, nope, we're all caught up on questions right now. Awesome. Um, I guess I think because we have a lot more on install and service, if we could maybe start that before we break. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then yeah. take a break midway. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, let's keep going. And then around like five o'clock-ish, we'll find a breaking point for everybody to have a little... Uh, We'll walk around, get a drink, do whatever you gotta do, and then we'll, we'll do that around five. Okay, great. So I, Greg's gonna take control of this. So Greg, you're on. Uh, good evening, everybody, or late afternoon. Uh, Greg Tomsick with TC. I'm the uh, VRF trainer, a startup commissioning agent, as well as the uh, service tech for uh, the Toshiba carrier, as well as other carrier products. 
Uh, any questions that you guys have as I go through, just let the uh, boys know and I'll uh, cover it as best as I can. Uh, we do have this system in operation at our Melrose Park location. So any jobs or any uh, system actually hands on once this little pandemic clears up and we uh, you know, can get back to normal life. Uh, if there's anything that you guys would like to see, Sal or Kevin or myself can be uh, contacted and we can get you rolling. Uh, typical VRF, this is going to be your three pipe system, uh, which is going to have a suction, discharge, gas, and a liquid line that's going to go down to either a single port, as you've seen in the slides before, or a multi port. The multi port, again, as I said, is single. Uh, phase. It needs to be powered individually and it needs to be trapped for condensation. Uh, the single ports do not. They are powered off the indoor unit as the smaller application within 50 feet. We'll get into that in the install section. Uh, the larger single port box has a footage of 125 or plus thereabouts. If you need the actual distance, we can get you the literature. But as I said earlier, we need to know where the unit is and what's the best application be in the area because a lot of codes, city of Chicago, uh, is different than the rest of the world. Here we see two in cooling, three in heating. Thermostats on individual units and one thermostat that's taking care of a multiple chain uh, as the outdoor units are as well. It's a header and a follower meaning that during the operation of the system, based not only on runtime or what load downstairs is needed, it will flip back and forth as any, you know, I guess stage chiller or boiler system would be. And we try to do equal runtime across everything. Uh, we'll get into it in the install, but as Sal mentioned, everything outdoors needs to be powered individually. Everything indoors can run off a of multiple panel breaker size correctly typically i see four or five smaller units 12,000 to 18,000 btus only draw about two amps so you know a 20 pole uh 208 is typically what i see on these so if it's a issue in the building and it's a rehab or something that's being fixed up and the panel service is light and another application you want to use may require a, an electrical change. This may be another option to use. One thing I just want to know, guys, is this oil equalization line. So when you're using variable compressors and multiple variable compressors, oil management is a big deal. Um, so you do have an additional line that connects these modules um, in addition to the three pipes. So just be aware of it. Um, you know, it, it needs to be tied in. On the oil equalization line, a lot of other systems and VRF manufacturers, when an alarm or there is an oil problem or an oil return issue in the system, will go into a full oil return. We monitor this in our three pipe constantly. And the only time I would see this or the system should do it is if the system is completely out of oil and it has to go into that reclaiming of the oil mode. We are always monitoring that in this system. Pre-planning, it's always the biggest. Some of us just get the job handed to us from the architects or the engineers and it's a go, but as the install and the startup commissioning agent for this product, uh, I like the guys in the field to know exactly what they're putting in, what they're starting. Training's always available. And we just need to make sure we have the right application. Unit placement's critical. Uh, as you see the rails here, we offer stands. We offer as TEC other options. If you don't have roof curbs or the tenant or customer is uh, leery on opening up the roof for anything, we have other options. Area around the condensers and where it's located will be critical as far as snowfall, pitched roofs, Obviously, we don't want to put anything under the steeple. Uh, electrical will go through as well as the sizing connection and what needs to be calculated, taken notes of, and what needs to be given to us before startup happens. 
will all be covered on uh, pretty much in this whole section. Any questions? Uh, so all of these need to be considered, guys, when installing. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about later is that refrigerant pipe length is super critical for charging. So when you're locating it, we need to know exactly how much refrigerant is going to run. Many of the angles and, and bends that you're putting in is very important. Um, and then, you know, locating it on the roof because it's a heat pump, um, snow will affect it. So if you're going to run this unit in winter time, it needs to be above the snow line. That is a critical thing. So this happens, this, this unit up here in the top left, you may possibly have issues. The snow line in Chicago is 14 inches. Um, they do need to be up on rails or some sort of stand, both for access and for heating operation in our winters. Uh, outdoor units, even in a heat pump or heat recovery, not so much, but more in the heat pump, will condensate in the winter. So if the unit is sitting on the ground or sitting on an area that can freeze, we have seen the condensate in the middle of winter in heat mode, ice up and basically climb itself all the way up to the coil on the condenser. And with the weight, it can buckle the lower section. So all of this stuff just is preliminary and needs to be discussed, but we can do that in a training formally, I guess I should say. Uh, Sal mentioned it a minute ago. Uh, 410A guys, split systems, our carrier, you know, APDs, ADUs, anything with an air handler and an outdoor unit, just like the VRS system, pipeline size is the way we charge. There is no subcooling superheat method for this system. Counting ceiling tiles, walking it off of your feet, or bottom line, going by what we give you in a submittal that will have links for our submittal and our building tool are not proper charging numbers. Can you zoom in on this or no? No, I can't. Okay. Uh, what you see in the bottom is basically any submittal that purchase system, bid system that you would get from TEC carrier that shows the runs, the equipment labeled with model serial of every piece of equipment for this system. There are different size, obviously, indoors. There are also different size branch joint hardware. All of this is labeled on the sheet that we give to our contractors. This shit should be carried through the job or blown up on a blueprint and the piping or the contractor, if it's a union job and you're not a fitting company or the fitter on site should keep track of everything that's in this system by crossing out what we've given you on a build basis and write the exact footage installed on the sheet. So Kevin's going to draw, give, give you guys this submittal with some standard lengths that he sees from, you know, the job. We need it filled out with the exact dimensions, the exact length that you're installing, and then we tell you how much refrigerant to put in based on that information. And being exact is very important or as exact as possible because if you do not have proper charge in the systems, you may have issues and you may not see them right away. They may be seasonal. So you never want to have a job that you start up and you have to keep coming back to because it wasn't charged for it and only stops working at certain times. Being I'll be hand, foot, step, mouth, whatever, through the process with us, uh, I'll have an idea of what's going on during startup, but that pipe length is critical. We want to make sure that we keep every inch of everything. I'm sure we're going to get some questions about 90s. You got them, put them down. The software is... I guess lenient, Kevin, maybe you could chime in and give him a better word, but it's not necessarily required guys, but if I have every single piece of pipe in that system, I can get it down to the ounces for the correct charge. Yeah, Kevin. Greg, yeah, guys, the more information, the better. All right. 
Obviously, use the correct four holes of the unit. You do not want to risk damage. Coming off the, the shop, off of the truck, coming from wherever to your shop. Uh, this isn't stock locally. It'll be a site drop off or at your shop, but the way it's unloaded or the way you handle it needs to be, you know, known. If we lift from the middle, we have a possibility of crushing stuff and moving compressor piping and causing a, you know, unfortunate leak. Uh, crane lifts, helicopter lifts, anything that's going to need to be uh, strapped. We need to make sure that the uh, lifting contractor has a spreader bar with them. Okay, I know it doesn't show it on this, but it makes this lift a lot easier. Uh, the correct way is the only way. System comes with lifting lug holes for the crane. Let's use them. Anchoring to a building, uh, we have other options if there's no curbs available on a roof. I mentioned before, Sal, you can chime in if you want. If the contractor or the business doesn't want to evade or invade the roof penetration with curbs, we can put rails or, as you've seen in previous pictures, I guess, treated four by fours. It's your installer's you know, job to do however you're going to put it up, but it has to be under the full rail of the unit. We cannot peer this. Okay, so as you see the full rail and front rail where the piping and the electrical entry to this unit is, is the front solid rail. That rail has to be on a solid surface. Anchor bolt, the vibration insulator. See the vibration insulator on there? That vibration insulator has to run the full length of the curb. Because if we don't run the full length of the curb or the rail it's on, we're peering it again. Okay. Twenty-four inch minimum plus your local. I just want everybody to think about it. I don't know if they got privacy fences or they've got other stuff on jobs, but this is what is required. So if we have any issues with height or what it should be, we need to talk about this and discuss this pre-ship or pre-check or sign off on this. The hoods that you see that are on this, you need them we can get you the dimensions to build them or let us know. Kevin, are, are, are we? Uh, we have an option to, to source them if needed, um, but you know, it, it's good to have. I mean, if you're going to keep good maintenance of your unit and you're going to go out there and ensure that if it's been off for a while and you try to start up and it's covered in snow, you're going to have issues, right? So, um, you know, it, it's not super common to have them, but it, it, it definitely doesn't hurt to throw those on. Multiple systems, multiple units, It'd be no different than any condenser or anything up on a roof in a parapet, as you see on the right. We got to make sure, guys, that if this is in a area where uh, we have stagnant air and I don't have the area to discharge the top of the condenser correctly and have a possibility of recycling that warm air, then we'll have to take some other measures. But standard one two three outdoor unit systems need to follow this 40 in front for 20 behind and a minimum in the middle okay we have snow hoods or we have any kind of you know wind guards or anything like that obviously that's going to change the distances that being said there's only so much interconnecting piping on a roof that we can have for these outdoor systems. So if we have a multiple system rail that five, six, seven of these are on, we need to make sure that we have the proper distancing for not only airflow, but for piping considerations. Any questions? We do have one question from Tula. Uh, for a new construction project, 
how is a VRF's first cost in energy consumption compared to a traditional VAV or heat pump system? Also, is there any utility incentives, rebates for VRF technology? Well, I'll, I'll put it real simple. If, if we think about it and I have the square footage, I can't put a rooftop in a building inside. If we go to the next slide, Sal, I think it's going to be pretty uh, explanatory. Okay, so well, before we get there, I guess, you know, it's somewhat complicated when you say a VAB system. Are you saying a rooftop system? Are you saying with electric heat? Are you saying with hot water heat? Are you saying chilled water air handler type system? So um, competitively, first cost is a little difficult to, to dial down without more specifics. Um, but the big thing is the efficiency of operation. Um, so your, your long-term efficiency costs are, are gonna be a lot lower than our standard rooftop unit. And most likely a chill water, hot water, you're gonna be very competitive as well. Um, you know, yeah, I would, I would hard agree. to say. I would agree. So, if you're talking about a VAV air handler, VAV boxes, building automation system, a boiler and a chiller and a cooling tower, I think VRF's gonna beat that on first price. Electric's electric, guys. I don't know what else to say. If I had a, a rooftop that has gas heat and, and yeah, I've got a VAV and it's got six zones, I mean, do I have reheats downstairs? Is it gas fired electric? Is it a hot water coil? I mean, there's so many applications that this could cover, but right. I don't have any gas. So I'm electric everywhere. Well, so that, I guess not, not having any gas is, is not going to help you with your utility bill discussion. It's going to make it more Thank expensive. You. The gas is going to make things cheaper to run if you have a lot of heating demand. So depends and on I also need a lot of duct work. Right. But, but if you're talking about a VAV system, by definition, you don't have a lot of heating demand. So heating's not really that exciting to this, to two's question. Um, right. I think that VRF on average is gonna beat, is gonna beat a package rooftop on efficiency, but struggle to beat it on first cost. And then uh, compared to a built up air handler with towers and boiler and chiller, it's gonna be more difficult to be competitive energy wise but you're going to easily beat it on first cost. I think it's between. I mean, a tenant in a separate space that has the, their own air handler, but it's fed from a building's water and source chiller or boiler. I mean, you're just paying for the electrical in that space to run the, the fan, you know? So I, again, application based, I guess. You know, guys, I'd like to add something just when it comes to comparing a zone system, that being your traditional four pipe system compared to a zoned VRF system. I think it's it's easily forgotten that the controls are, that being the zoning controls, are already built into the VRF system. Well, well if you have a system, system, that's correct, Kevin, thank you. System, and you have VAV boxes scattered all over your building that all need their own field installed controls and stats and everything else. You're bringing on a lot more from a first cost standpoint, as Ryan mentioned. Correct. Uh, in regards to rebates, yeah, you can take that one, Ryan. I would say there, there, so on a new construction project, which is what two was specifically asking about, you can get rebates for anything that can save energy. Um, so there's a, in the case of ComEd, which is where two would normally be working, um, you can get rebates for doing anything that's going to be more efficient than than the code baseline. And there's a special program for that. It would not be product specific for new construction. I'm New construction kidding. bills going for lead jobs or going for, you know, efficiency jobs. I'm seeing this product a ton more. I'll put it like that. Back to what I said, if I uh, had a 120 ton rooftop and then I can just, you know, run through everything, every floor is down. Uh, if the rooftop's down, nobody gets anything. If I put it in a doghouse and I can individually run each system to each floor, you know, maybe I have a problem in one area. Uh, this is what you see on this slide is our doghouse application, which uh, we will go through all of the measurings and what kind of outside air is needed and duct work to make sure that this is efficient. But uh, a condenser that's inside in a 50 degree room in the winter is a lot better than in a negative 10 on a roof, I guess. That's all I can say about that. Back so to the your big thing is you need to ensure days. that the air in that room is getting ducted out and new air is getting brought in, right? That's correct. Uh, 
30 ton three system uh, slammed in the back of the parking garage isn't going to work. Uh, the outdoor fan high static pressure, this is for a internal unit to make sure that the duct work that we're expelling out of the space for the condenser is actually getting to the correct place that it needs to be. Right. You're basically turning up the fan speed so that you can overcome this extra static that you're putting on the unit. Right. So everybody's going to ask about this application. Yeah, the condenser's got the ducts and the dampers inside another building. This space has a huge exhaust on it. So if anybody's confused, that's the answer to that one. Uh, continue. Any questions? We are good on questions right now. Okay, insulation section, uh, I'm going to cover in this basically the components of our heat pump and heat recovery Shiva system. Whenever you order a system, whether it's a single model, dual, or a three, uh, will come with hardware. This is the outdoor unit branching connection fittings. These fittings are from the factory. That is not Ace Hardware T on that. That Y cannot be made up of a bunch of 90s and couplings. This has to be in the system. Uh, the picture you're seeing is also the indoor piping coming up to the roof, if we can picture that, coming into the single port of the Y and the crooked leg. On that outdoor fitting is the way it comes from the factory. That has to go to the outdoor unit. We can't put it in another way. You want to go to the next one? Okay. That T looks, or that Y branch looks exactly like you're seeing it. And the crooked leg goes to the first, and then it follows on. If we had three instead of two, as the slide shows, we would just have another Y in the same place between the second and the third. That Y has to be level. It has to run left to right and flat. I'm sorry if the slide shows it is something else, but it cannot be anywhere else. That cannot be mounted below the roof and pointed vertically. It has to lay horizontal and it has to lay flat. Okay. The T, the single port of the T has to go to the outdoor unit. Right. Header. First unit, it's always the header as well as the header unit if we have a two or a three pipe system is always the largest of the systems in row. So if we have three 144s, doesn't matter. If we have multiple sizes of BTUs, the largest has to be the first pipe two. Okay. Now, I know the incorrect picture is like, I don't know how anybody could pipe it, but we get it. So if it looks nice, it's probably correct. I know that that T from the slide looks like it is tilted upwards. The only fitting that can be tilted upwards is that if you're coming in from the underneath of the unit, not from the front. We'll see some slides here in a minute if anybody wants to chime in for me to, you know, correct the way it is. But again, heat recovery, three pipes. Okay, two T's. The suction gets the goofy, goofy Y. Okay, it's going to be the way it is. And again, I'll state that's not a T or anything that can be made up. Okay, it's lost. You get to order everything again. Also, when you get this piping, it has packaging material in there. Okay, that's not packaging material. That is the wrap or the insulation for that fitting. 
okay? I know this is outside, not as critical. We have whys that are indoors that if the, you know, packing material or whatever they thought it was is lost, it can't be ordered. It needs to be a whole new order of the fittings. So head guy on the job just needs to make sure that we keep everything together. These fittings have numbers. Every fitting based on our piping layout on our submittal has to have that fitting in the spot that it is labeled on the submittals piping diagram. Okay. The balance pipe, real quick. That is not a factory fitting. And yes, you can go to Ace Hardware Home Depot to get that. That's the oil equalization, correct? It's correct. It's the only one, and that's why it's blue. So all six of these come with the units with the order. This oil equalization would not come with it, and you can just provide it a standard T for it. Okay. This is the outdoor Y-shaped branch. I call it the dog leg because obviously, you know, or you know, leg that's not straight is the first piped header. It's the largest header discharge line on the suction side. And as you see in the uh that it can't be on its side. Again, I know you guys see it all on the, can you go back to the previous? Okay, you see how it's laying on its side here? I get this in class. It's, we're just showing it to you, everyone, okay? The next picture says you can't lay it on its side, but it looks like it's laid on its side. It can't be on its side. It has to be flat within 15 degrees, as the slide shows. Can we open it up to anybody? I don't know if we have to open it up. Uh, the snake tongue, the bare wire, 1985, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's out there still doing it. Uh, this isn't going to work. Uh, we wanted it with a ring terminal, uh, some sort of a grommet, an eye holder, solid to the lug. Refrigerant piping and any heat pump or heat recovery, every line has to be insulated. Okay, so nothing's insulated here. Uh, number two, uh, the ground isn't a good insulator. I'll probably get the question, but I'll just cover it now. Can the pipes be buried in the ground? If there's an application or we have to remotely run the condenser piping from a parking garage across the street, it can be buried, but we need to know that ahead of time, okay? It's something we're gonna wanna stamp before you do it. So please let us know if you plan on doing something like that. We don't wanna have to deal with possibly digging it up and all that in the future, so. Yeah, nothing that I've ever seen buried undergrounds under anything except for a main street or a, a parking lot, so. Uh, Everybody's used to site glasses, filter dryers, uh, removable core dryers, uh, mufflers. This system gets none of the above. Uh, I see contractors that don't use nitrogen. They put removable core dryers on to you know, clean the system. Uh, it's not going to work. In VRF, any kind of muffler, removable core dryer, solenoid valve, is a place for expansion or a place for the refrigerant to do something that's not flowing normally. It causes issues as well as there's no way to pull that out without taking the whole system down. Uh, the units come factory with 25 pounds. In the event of something broke, somebody missed a solder, Something happens. Pump downs with filter dryers aren't going to work correctly. Uh, also, being a heat pump, uh, most of the time nobody thinks that it's going to be a biflow, and they only put a one-way dryer in, so that's not going to work either. No accessories into this. Okay. Uh, this is indoors. Uh, we talked about this. 
this uh, specifically uh, has no head. It just basically went out the side of the wall. Uh, this is an actual, you know, application we need to discuss. Uh, I don't have the room in here. Airflow is a problem. I mean, there's just many things. But you guys look at this. I, it's just not a, uh, it's not a stove or a uh, restaurant's grill. Okay, it's not a makeup air hood that we have to put up above this. Okay, this needs to be. You're, you're going to get air bouncing back out, right? And then recirculate well, here. It, that. it could be. I agree. It could be a bunch of issues, but bottom line is uh, also that disconnect was the only one per two units. There wasn't a second one. Every outdoor unit has to have its own breaker and has to be powered individual. Minimum on high walls. It's more of just that if you know the product, uh, four inches above and, and room on the sides. The top won't lift up on this. Uh, it ices up. Greg, can I make a note real quick, just going back to that past slide there, Sal? So it's not sheet metal work sticker. Right. So guys, just to let you know, so our smallest six ton heat recovery module standalone, which is very similar to how that looks. That fan has the ability to churn 6,700 CFM. So just imagine 6,700 CFM blowing up into that duct and deadheading and what it's gonna do and how it's gonna degrade the performance of that VRF outdoor unit. Uh, condensate pump, as you see below, I know it's a little giant. Uh, you guys have probably seen on the ductless one-to-ones, the two-to-five, whatever it may be, have to have a pump or it's naturally drained. So if we have an application with a bunch of these, I'm sure if it's new construction, it's all been covered. But this has to have a natural gravity or has to have a pump. It does not come with a pump. So you need more clearance here, right? Because you return through the top of the unit and supply out the bottom, and you would not want your thermostat right here where it could possibly be getting hit with airflow. Okay, so back to the thermostat thing. So we're all aware. Uh, Sal showed the button sensor, uh, the simple stat, and the programmable. All VRF products with Carrier, Toshiba, come factory return air sensing. That stat could be, I guess, three rooms away and still say I need it 69, 70 in the room, and it's fine because I'm not looking for a thermostat reading. Okay, I refer to this product as a wall controller. Is it a thermostat? Is it the way that people want the room to set the temperature for? Yes, but it's not temperature sensing. We can, if you want to read from the thermostat, change it. It just needs to be known ahead of time. So out of the box, I set this thermostat to 72 degrees. This unit's going to control read what the 70. ceiling pitched against it reads, correct? It's going to read. It's going to try to control the 72 return air temperature. Correct. So that's a big deal if the customer thinks the thermostat's. They think it, they set it for 72 and it's 72 up here, but it's not 72 down here in the space. That's a problem. Most everything that's a ductless or a commercial VRF product, heat pump or heat recovery, a read from the return air. Uh, this picture is a little uh, short telling of what really is going on, but you'll see it here in a few slides. Uh, guys, I can't breathe here. I can't clean anything. I mean, it just it just screams issues coming. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, uh, I'll just leave it this explanatory. Dimensions that are in the install manual that not only our architects and engineers go by, as far as one product to the next, or you see as a can do this product if it's done with Mitsu or whatever, we need to pay attention to stuff. Nothing out there in the field, guys, is going to work in a cardboard box. Okay. This isn't 
going to work. It didn't work. I have snow problems from the top. Anything under a pitch or a steepled roof that could, I guess, at least snow on lodge and come down on the unit, it, it's going to be an issue. This is a refurb. This is a new construction. But as you can see, you know, how can I do anything in this? Plus, you need clearances, right? Well, the fence inches. wasn't there when they put it there. So that's my point. Okay. Something that's there, guys, may not be there, but bottom line, that roof was. Okay. So again, we just need to be aware of where this stuff's going in. Catching it ahead of time is a lot better than this. Sure is a fitter. Everybody that's doing plumbing sees that soft solder holds up to so much PSI. I get the arguments all the time and the questions about it. Why won't it hold? It may. Problem with this product is you need flux. It's bad. Uh, try running nitrogen through a system and trying to soft solder. Good luck. Uh, this application here, they didn't use soft solder, but this is in the bottom of the unit. It's not acceptable. Okay, guys, we either braze it or outside the city of Chicago. Uh, there's other applications, but city of Chicago, this ain't going to fly. City of Chicago, everything has to be brazed. We'll just go into it now. Uh, flare connections, city of Chicago are not allowed. Pressure relief valves, factory must not be used. A valve has to be put in, field installed. Uh, I'm not seeing it anymore, but uh, city of Chicago requires any system, VRF, split, rooftop, chiller anything out there over 100 pounds of refrigerant has to have an ex has to have a fireman's dump okay fireman's dumps when you have a condenser that's nine stories up that requires a dead leg from the condenser circuit liquid line run down to the main fireman's access in a building is going to kill your systems. It's not going to work. Okay. So if we're not, which believe me, we're on it, something comes up where you have something that may total that amount and it's in the city of Chicago, then we need to talk about that. Kevin, you want to add anything? Yeah, just there's ways around it with designing, you know, how many outdoor units you have per indoor units and systems to keep the refrigerant lower. We've also been working with some of the fire inspectors to to see if we can put the valve up on the roof and some of them have been okay with it. So it's just something to be aware of. If if we're designing a system and we see the refrigerant's above 100 pounds, we're going to talk to you about it and see if we can look at other options to try to get it less than it. Or otherwise, we're going to try to talk to the inspector to see if there's a way we can get around it. So. Remember, guys, I'm not the blueprint. If it's not on the blueprint and we're, for some reason, which I can't imagine we would, but in the event, we're over 100 pounds, it doesn't say it in the blueprint, and here comes Mr. Inspector and it's flagged, then that's not a Toshiba carrier or problem in the, you know, in the blueprint, okay? I want you guys to be aware if you're out there and you're installing this stuff that we need to know about this. If we catch it before all this stuff goes in, we can make the changes or talk to who, you know, is in charge or what the application was to fix it. Now, this doesn't work when we're six months down the road and this place needs to open and it's flagged. Okay. Flares. Obviously, as we discussed, it's not going to go city of Chicago, but line sets soft copper line sets that are flared for ductless or i guess vrf that nut and that flare has to be removed and we need to use the nut that comes with the system and we need to use a 410a flaring block okay this is what happens when we have either a ridge as you can kind of see in the middle, which it was, where we clean the outside of the pipe real good after we make a cut, but we don't clean the inside of it, okay? We put the flaring tool on it, which may be a plumber's block or maybe a four, you know, a 22 
flare. We'll get into that the next slider here. And it doesn't hold. So the first thing that everybody does is they tighten, tighten, tighten. Well, they cracked it. It'll never hold now. So again, right tools for the right applications. 410A flaring block. Is it the next one, I believe? No. That flare has to go. It's Chicago. Otherwise, we need to check it. We need to pressure test 500 PSI. It needs to hold for 24 hours. If it holds, we should be fine. The blue goo, the leak lock, the tape, any of this stuff should not be used on any flare in a system as a VRF that we can use flares on. A good flare will hold with the nut and the proper flare. So you can see that the pipe from the front is the one way we can come out the bottom of this unit. That's the only application, as I said earlier, that that T can be turned on its end to go up into the condenser. The suction line Y with the crooked leg still has to lay flat. Crooked leg still has to go to the largest or the first outdoor unit. And if we're coming from the underneath, it has to have a 90 off of it. Okay. I'll go into the brazing stuff. Uh, cool gel, wrap it. Whatever you guys got to do, bottom line is this, nitrogen has to be used in all practices of any of this work. Clean, dirty VRF jobs, you'll never get away from all of the work and everything with this system. And the reason it will work, because the contractor's taken the time, taken the measures, and done everything properly, and we walk away. Any of those steps are missed or not done, we're back again. Brian, do we want to maybe break questions? Yeah, let's do these couple questions that came in, and then we'll take a break here. Uh, these should be pretty fast ones. Uh, Joseph asks, does Toshiba make ducted indoor units? Yeah. We have a static to low uh, ceiling and so they, correct? Yeah, they, they make a number of different models depending on how much ductwork you're looking to put it on. They make a conventional style like you would see as, as your furnace just with a fan coil. Um, so you can get some larger external static off of that. And then they make the slim duct type that go above the ceiling um, or that you could turn vertically as well. Um, so there's a number of them. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, guys, it's uh, a half ton to eight tons when it comes to ducted units. And, and I'll go on the ducted units real quick to add on to this. Uh, static on these units is critical. So this all has to be balanced and it has to be you know, measured and ducted properly. Uh, highest static on our biggest unit is what, 0.8, Kevin, I believe? Roughly, depending on the filtration that you would use, yeah. I mean, you know, most ducted furnaces or whatever, you're looking at a 0 0.4, 0 0.5, maybe external. So uh, we need to make sure that the duct run isn't, you know, halfway across the building or the space and that it's sized properly to make sure that we have the proper CFM available uh, when we're ready. All right. One more question. Uh, Ferris asks, how easy is it to add, remove, or replace air handlers in the future? Uh, that's an interesting question. No, it, it's, so. it's intricate. Uh, two things. It's probably number one, valves. Uh, VRF systems, as far as what we're talking about today from a TEC carrier product line, don't require isolation valves. Any leak, any crack, any break, any problem with any refrigeration issue, no matter what, may be fixed to shut one zone off to fix that, but the amount of refrigerant lost or leaked out or whatever in that event, the whole system's gonna have to be reclaimed anyways. It's more of a service aspect with valves. Uh, so we can take care of that individual zone. If a service you know, issue arrives on the second point, 
Uh, future add-ons for larger systems where we're working in phases. I'll let Kevin kind of go through that, what we like to do. Sure, sure. Just real quick, guys, if, uh, if you're working on an opportunity and you know that the owner is going to want to expand their VRF system later on down the road, really, we, we want to, you know, do our due diligence on what they're going to try to accomplish in the future. So then we can size that outdoor unit or that VRF condensing unit appropriately. And then also to make sure that those mains are appropriately sized for the future expansion. That's pretty and, much and going, the plan, guys. Sorry, Kevin. Just going on what Greg said, uh, isolation ball valves for the indoor units are not required for the system to operate, but they are very nice to have. So putting in isolation valves would definitely help you if you needed to swap out an indoor unit where you can just valve it off, pop the new one on. If so, there's a couple of questions that came in, so I'll ask those uh, and then we'll continue on. Is that cool, guys? That works with me. All right, so let's pick up with these questions. Um, Tula asks, uh, can the customer use the VRF control software to monitor or trend the system performance data? Um, you can to get some extent, limited. I guess, I guess to be my, it would be to what extent? Uh, if we were using it with an eye view, I believe, Sal, it's not an issue, correct? You can get limited trend and information data from just the touchscreen controller. Um, I don't know the exact number of days of information, but it's not going to be any energy usage with just that. It's more just what your temperatures were, um, what your set points were, that type of information. Um, so I, it depends on what all you're looking to trend. Obviously, with a with the building automation system, you can trend a ton of information. All right. Uh, Joseph asks, uh, for the board that's controlling the uh, EEV, on existing air handlers with retrofit evaporator coils, does it control the fan motor or the control voltage for the motor starter? Is there a fan, fan coil box and we had a system to where the fan coil box at the end of the day, the system's down, fan coil comes on, we have proper airflow across it. It's gonna have a link to turn that on with a separate relay, as well as the discharge, the return and the coil temperature to modulate that e that exv eev post modulating valve whatever you guys would like to discuss it if, if joseph's referring to the the dx kit that's correct order, we can with the dx kit that the point of that is to receive a zero to ten volt signal from the air handler controller to modulate it based on what it needs um that's how you can get the, the modulation control of the unit so it's, it's not meant to be a full air handler controller and fully control the fan in that application um, with the return air control it can enable the fan um, but it's not meant to you know modulate it or do duct static pressure control or anything along those okay. lines it's a lot simpler than that so so the vrf system is not taking control of the air handler the air handler is taking control of that piece of the vrf system so instead of modulating a hot water, chill water valve or whatever, the air handler controller would modulate an input to this board that would modulate the EXV. Definitely, if you wanted to do the supplier temperature control method, where you're controlling capacity directly for the returner, you could do limited control of the air handler, just like turning a fan on and off, but it's not meant for that. I mean, we're just a relay, having... we're just a relay box to make it simple. We're, we're, we're not doing any kind of modulating or any kind of signal. We're only talking to the EXV for the coil feeding. As far as any kind of fan on or alarm or anything like that, that'll have to be either BAS or through some other type of a field installed device. But I don't know if that makes it clear. It actually made me more confused. I'm going to say it one more way. One more way, I think the way it is. The air handler would have its own controls unrelated to the VRF system. The, the VRF system is only controlling the cooling heating capacity valve. And I have an air prover switch that closes. I have an air prover switch that closes and tells okay. me well that I have. I have. Like if to say what device you're talking about. All right, Greg, hang on, hang on. Okay, so there's two options of the DX kit. There's a supplier control DX kit and there's a returner control DX kit. So if you want to do the supplier control, 
then you have to have the air handler controller provide a zero to 10 volt signal to stage that, that coil. If you're using the return air temperature control, you can run that off of its own return air and give it a set point with the wired controller and it can enable a fan, but that's all it can do. So if there's like an economizer it needs to control, it's not gonna do that. Um, so it's not meant to be fully controlling in there. It has limited capabilities of what it can do with that option. Got it. Uh, Lorenzo asks, does the controller need airflow proving switch before it allows refrigerant to flow? That's what Greg was just saying. The return air supplier would depends on what we're using. I mean, I'm going to need something to make sure that the fan's on. I, I think that would be normal, and that's where I get back to the field installed device. When you say you're going to need something, do you mean the DX controller? If I have an on-off, if I have an on-off control, and, and I would be smart as the installing contractor to put it through a fan switch to make sure that I'm just not controlling to nothing out there, then yes, you do. I'm not. I'm not clear on what you're saying. It is highly recommended to have an airflow proof switch when you're controlling it. If you're using the return air controller, um, it, it, it does, I do not. I do not believe it has an input for it to monitor it. Um, but we would definitely recommend that it, it, it's installed on there. As an and the, the airflow proofing switch would wire to what specifically? The on-off command of on that style. The return air, as Sal speaking of, is based on temperature sensors. So if I don't have any airflow and I do come on, my coil is going to freeze and I'm going to shut off because I have no airflow. So what am I wearing the airflow switch to? To the air handler controller or to the DX supplier Toshiba controller? Discharge air. Air handler controller. Air handler controller. Okay. Got it. Next question. I think we are caught up on questions and ready to resume, gentlemen. Okay, always use nitrogen. Uh, air gas, uh, gas uh, Chicago has research ultra high purity for systems that have a high moisture content. Fatty acids, as it shows on the right, this is just gonna be basically install protocol. Uh, the faster and the harder we pull a vacuum on a system, any of the uh, residuals in there freeze to the side of the piping, which gives us a, a micron that's unattainable because we pulled it too fast. Uh, nitrogen in general, which will go into the three part purging stage at the pressure testing in a few slides, uh, should always be used if it will not pull down to the proper micron and we are positive that it's held 500 psi for 24 hours we know there's no leak and it's a moisture issue in the medical grade or the ultra high purity uh, nitrogen will dry the system out extremely well talked about it earlier no field installed devices on this at all in the event of compressor burnout or a contamination of the system, uh, a bypass and a two-way filter dry or removable coil will need to be put in. And after that, it will need to be removed. So guys, I get back to the install points. Uh, Sal's highlighted ball valves. Okay, the stuff that I'm showing here, as we all know, we're gonna be out at the condenser anyway. So, uh, but again, nothing on this system with a normal split heat pump or anything needs to have any of these devices in. This is the indoor branching joint. Uh, similar to Y, just a little different as far as the shape. The only difference is that this can be mounted vertically if we are a system going from five to floor four to three to two, and we're branching off at each floor. We can do that with this particular Y. It cannot be put on its side though. It still has to be vertical or 
flat within 15 degrees. All of these Ys on the layout, the submittal and the print have numbers. The box comes with them. They have to be installed in the specific positions on the flow of the units on the submittal. If we have a change because of a wall or there's piping or there's something in the way where this unit is no longer in front of the downstream unit and it's gonna become the downstream unit, we need to know. Kev, you wanna just kind of make sure that that's, I said that right, correct? Any changes in the field, we need to know that's moving units from where they're located on the flow chart, correct? Yes, for sure. We would have to reconfigure it in our software uh, to make sure that, you know, we're still going to have a sustainably operating system, guys, is what it comes down to. There's 20 units in the system, guys, and we get down to number 15 and we've ran all this pipe and we got to move this unit to another spot, okay? It may change, it may not. We That's what I'm saying. We need to know. Velocity, pipe size is critical in the system, okay? The picture here shows, as I said, I know we see it on all the slides so you can see the Y. It's pretty, it's nice to run like this. It's bad for the system. Those Ys have flow devices in them based on the system, pressures, velocity, how they've tested them at the factory, that the oil and the refrigerant will tend to go to the lower side of this and we have starving problems, we have compressor burnouts and we have low oil return because of this, All right? This is a no-no. This system is fine. The problem is, is it sounds like a, a five inch roof drain Velocity, more 90s in the system, Ys close to each other, bends and turns that are all in close proximity cause noise. This is a mechanical room. Haven't heard any or hadn't seen any problems, but this is maybe where we wanted to use the two pipes. Sal, yes, you know, what do you think? Hey. Well, I mean, you could use a branch selector as well, or a flow selector with the three pipe, right? So, uh, yeah. But guys, this looks weird. Again, I, I wouldn't suggest it being like this. You can see above the ceiling how everything comes out as far as the uh, pump goes on a cassette, as you see here. And I'll restate that. Uh, this unit comes with a lift pump. We'll get into it here in a minute. It's not a condensate. It's an evacuation pump, 26, 28 inches to a external pump, little giant or natural gravity or wherever it may go. This is not meant to run, again, the 43 foot ahead like a little giant and, you know, however far away. Okay. This is also hung off of this rafter system here and everything. Isolation, guys, is, is key with all this stuff because remember, the fan, when the system's on, unless that thermostat is off, the fan runs all the time. Okay, so little nuances is running and like little shakes and everything. It says no isolation on it at all. Okay, just thoughts about, you know, what you need to think about when you're installing it. But we're okay with the Y joints with how they're installed in the piping. Okay, so, we're, so that goes to the next one. The next one would go to the next one and so forth. It's correct. It's flat. It's insulated. Okay. Heat pumps. Again, uh, we have a conference room on the chain of common areas, I would say, not offices, we hope. And instead of running four branch joints, we just take a main header to a, basically a one manifold and we can run it off of this. This can be mixed and matched in any of the systems, correct? Just for heat pump, right? For the heat pump? 
Oh yeah. Well, I'm just saying if we have this and then we have a bunch of Y's, correct? Yeah. Correct. No combining headers on this system, correct, Kevin? Correct. Okay. Heat pump. So not going to be using this. Obviously, we have the three pipes. This is a heat recovery application. Three in and two out. All of these pipes on the incoming size of this are different sizes, guys. I see it, though. It gets crossed up in the field, and they get them mixed. We need to make sure that we have exactly what the right size is in coming into each of these, okay? There's no reducing or shouldn't be any reducing coming into this. This is a sweat box. There is no flare on this as well. Okay, Ace Hardware. Right, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, the flow box is an oil trap. That's why you can't mount it north to south. It has to be, you know, horizontal, never up and down. I understand hotels, certain spaces have limited hallway ceiling height. A lot of times the architect or engineer likes to put the flow selector box in the hallway. Noise maybe be one reason, but harmonics and anything with solenoid valves or refrigerant moving through anything can travel. The face of the service door on this where the model number is has a flange all the way around it. If it's pinned to the ceiling, you may not be able to get it out we should have space between whatever it's hung to and the actual box itself. Use the hangers to hang it. Uh, do you, you want to go through this or you want me to? I, I, either well, way. I mean, I guess this kind of just shows some of the flexibility that you have with how you do the piping install based on the building that you have. Right. And you can even think of it as, you know, these these manifolds on the heat recovery could be branch saw air flow selectors. Right. So um, it's really just what's good for your building, what's easiest and most economical for you to install. Hey, Sal, um, just because uh, it was asked prior, um, those headers, you can pretty much locate those wherever you want to, whether it be heat pump or heat recovery. Okay. So, guys, if I have three pumps coming into a flow selector box, a single, okay, not a multi, and a single, and I have a conference room, and I just have no reason to use the Ys, and it's just maybe easier to branch out eight pipes instead of just a common, you can use it. It's application-based, so as it says, you know, I, I don't see it a lot except for on heat pumps, but... We can use it on both. So this is really just looking at, you know, all of the different line lengths that you're going to need to add up to give us the information to charge it correctly, right? The critical information we're looking for um, to get you charged right so you're doing the, you know, the correct startup of the system so you're not going to have callback. There is limited pipe in these systems. Bottom line, we do have 3,200 feet, or what is it, Kevin, as far as total length of total feet on this? 3, it all depends on what system you're, you're using, but yeah, you're in that range for the typical system. And not too many times do I see 70 feet before the first unit is, but we can do it if you need it. Yeah, there are essentially there are limits on how 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 you're going to pipe, right? You have a lot of flexibility to work with, and you can do some pretty long lengths. Um, but just be aware of it, and let us work with you on how you're going to do it um, to make sure you're doing it the correct way. Basically, you see the manifold and the Ys on this one. 
Uh, critical is the floor above it. If we're on the seventh and we're going to go down to the first with the next one, a lot of these guys are stuff that I don't see because I just don't see it. Remember this stuff from the east, over in the east, you know, Eastern Asia market where everybody is in buildings, living on top of each other and stuff. Things change a little bit, but these are just, I'll say engineering and architect, no numbers that this is the way it has to be. Okay. Max height for heat pump, 230 feet. So yeah, you have a lot less feet when your outdoor units are below your indoor units, right? For heat pump, this was 230 when you're above, when you're below, it's only 130. And then similar uh, for heat recovery, different lengths that you have. Again, we're here to help Not you guys. Not too many times, guys, do I see in this particular here with the heat recovery, you see the box as it is in front of the indoor unit, air handler, fan coil, whatever you like to call it, where you're going to have a, a flow selector box that's at 100 feet away from the unit. Okay, this is just guidelines, but I guess if you need to do it, you got a hundred feet. Uh, again, strange, but it's possible to do. Greg, I'm just going to add something here real quick. You know, guys, when it comes to do designing systems, you're going to come to us anyway with your design and the layout essentially, and we're going to have to run it through our software anyway to make sure that it's gonna work within our limitations. So yes, the, you know, this, is, this can be a little overwhelming with all of these limitations from piping distances that we're throwing at you here, but really at the end of the day, you're gonna to come to us and we're gonna build this system for you. And we're gonna build it to make sure that we're keeping everything inside those limitations, so. Uh, we spoke about flares earlier, I know everybody, did apparently knows how to do it or not, but a 410A flare guy still has the 45. It's the same angle, but the face on this is wider and has a larger surface area because of the pressure of 410A. So when you see this picture and you see that flare nut, that is the flare nut that comes on the indoor, the outdoor, whatever part of our system has a nut on it, has to have the nut on its connector, okay? Yes, line sets are same threaded, they say, or this or that or whatever, but best practice is use what the distributor sends with the unit, okay? On flares, hard pipe, I'll give you three eighths maybe, but hard pipe has to be annealed to make a good flare. You're not going to flare a piece of 7 8 hard copper. Okay, so we need to make sure that if we're using flares, that we're either off of the Y soft or we're heating it up based on the size. You're not going to see too many of the equipment that we're speaking about today over 5 8 of any line, but regardless, any hard piper has to be flared the proper way. And it's not going to be able to without a without it being annealed. Okay. You see the distance? Got nothing to do with that angle. Okay. 475 on any 22 unit anywhere would have never even got that high. We can run at 500 on this. We have safeties. I mean, it's just the way that 410 refrigerant is. That's why. The pipe distance and the pipe links and everything that's installed on this job is so critical. Torque wrench. Use a torque wrench. A three, a three foot a crescent or a three foot pipe wrench on a two foot one and an eighth inch breaker bar down on the ground to make sure it doesn't leak anymore. That this isn't going to cut it. it it's pretty standard across anything with a flare and a torque, okay? We have these kits still, correct, Sal? Yep, 
and guys, Greg mentioned this earlier, but a lot of the leak issues that we have are from guys not using torque wrenches and over torquing these flares and creating leaks. So please try to follow as best you can when you're doing the installs so that leaks are going to cause you problems for years with these systems. And I don't mean with the goo and the tape and everything else on it. That's the other thing, okay? To stop a leak or to stop a flare from not seeding right to put uh, blue paste or Teflon and then wrap it like most of good fitters and, you know, plumbers do because they're in that is not what a flare needs. Flare needs a good flare and the copper to the copper and that's it, okay? Uh, closed cell insulation, uh, code in the city or code in the area you're in needs to be followed. It's pretty much, I think it's one inch in Chicago now. Uh, every pipe has to be individually insulated, heat pump or heat recovery with any system. Everything is insulated. City of Chicago, other places require the UV shielding for the outdoor before it goes down the a roof portal or they require it indoors to where it's all in like a boiler or any kind of a steam or a chiller piping shield that's fine it has to be individually piped wrapped before it gets a solid insulation or a coating over it okay both wrapped as you see here as far as the control wires that you see there that's going to be code again. Does it need to be in conduit? You're going to have to run to it. Can you run it with the line set? Run it with the line set. Uh, trapeze is a uh, teardrop one holder, pipe holders aren't going to work with this unless it has like any, again, boiler, chiller, hanger would have. It needs the aluminum shield underneath it. Okay. When we get the Insulation on these units squished, we lose our RF factor, and yes, we can leak water. Or yes, we can condensate in the ceiling. Drains we talked about, standard, eighth of an inch for every three feet, coat here. Guys, if we're going to go to a common drain, we need to make sure that we have all the proper sizing. I see pumped units that are pumping into a common drain that are right next to the unit drain. So I could actually, in theory, pump water into something. We need to make sure that this is all spread out and laid out correctly, okay? Uh, the bucket of water and the five gallon bucket in the wall or making a trap or anything like that, nothing needs to be done with except for straight out and put it down to the natural gravity or on our units that have internal lift pumps it comes with an adapter 12 inches that has to be straight we don't bend that into a trap we don't bend it into a 90 we put it exactly as it comes straight out from that connection we can go in to a 90 or pump wherever we want to How many of these units have all of these pumps in them? I think 90%. The high wall needs one, and the Kevin low stat or the high static needs one. Yeah, the high static units need a field installed condensate pump or lift pump. We can offer that, or they can buy it from their local vendor if they need. Correct. Uh, you got it. Say Antonio has a question. Uh, he asks, How durable are these flare connections? Seems like that is going to be a big problem if it leaks. I imagine replacing pipes would be common on something like this. Pressure testing 500. If you can continue to have a leak and a leak and a leak at the same flare, then that's something we can discuss. But most of the time, what he's speaking about is a soft copper line set and the flare hasn't been removed and a good one put on and the factory nut added to it. 
I see it more than enough. That's why I stress if you have to put goo, Teflon tape, paste, anything on it, and it still won't seal, then either we need to discuss it, send me pictures, we can talk about it, or we need to just braze it in, apparently. So really, what, what we're saying, what, what, what we recommend is actually cutting the factory flare, flares and putting your own on using the factory nut, just to ensure that you know even in shipping there is no potential damage to that flare. Um, because, like you said, it is critical to have proper 410 flares on all the connections, unless you're in city of Chicago or you're braced. Not many vendors, carrier, LG, whatever we want to say sell their own line sets for their equipment maybe some do but anything like this use the factory supplied equipment we spoke about this as far as bending that rubber down uh city of chicago won't allow it because you can't run pvc uh copper adapter uh to a uh, threaded fitting will fit into that housing on the like I said, as you see here, or any of our other units with pumps. Outdoor unit power wiring. Uh, single phase, obviously, if it's three phase, we're gonna need the right size. This is all basically sized and taken care of by the electrician. Every outdoor unit has to have its own breaker, had a breaker panel, and a disconnect. We don't daisy chain main power. We don't bring one line sized correctly for both units to a junction box and split off to two separate disconnects. It has to be individually breakered to each outdoor unit. Everything indoor or outdoor, again, needs to be properly sized for the wiring and everything else. If you're the refrigeration and electrical contractor, that needs to be out ahead of time. This is basically just going to show all of the MCAs and the recommended fuses if we have a, I guess, a pull fuse disconnect. So single phases. As you can see here, a main circuit breaker, that's the panel in the first box to the left, local disconnect, second box, each one individually powered and grounded. So no daisy chains. On the power. Main power, that's correct. Uh, front knockouts are located. You're going to use it as far as the main and the control wiring. Uh, you can come from underneath as well. Contract will have to supply his own whip, but it's all there. So this is the inside of the unit. Power terminal supply block labeled clearly L1, L2, L3. Bottom is the control wiring. Uh, this system has six terminals, all labeled where the wiring needs to go. I mentioned earlier the snake tongue or the bare wire underneath the factory supplied termination bar is not allowed and it won't be good. It needs to have a ground ring or whatever it may be on it. Indoor unit, this is cassette. Same terminal strip will be in every indoor unit. Four wires, two for the thermostat, two for the communication bus. Okay. There's your main power, L1, L2, and a ground. Okay. If we're going to use one breaker, guys, for the indoors, size it properly per local code, but typically four to five units at two amps is what I see on the 20 or the 30 or double pull on most installs. So single pull, uh, flow selector, this is the 50-foot flow selector. It can be mounted 
outside of 50 feet, mainly because the wiring and the plugs that come with it are size like that. Five pins and two main power. I stress that that is 208 single phase. Some local uh, businesses or local uh, villages may not allow that. I'll say high voltage, but it's not, but may not allow a 208, 230 wire just being strung across the ceiling without being in a conduit. Multi-port, individually powered. That should never be put in the system with anything. It has to have its own power, its own circuit, its own drain. Any questions, Ryan? We did get one. Um, how do you check for phasing? Okay, so hey, that's a great question. Uh, number one, clean power delta good. Let me let me say this right here. Clean power delta phased as where every single leg to ground measures 120 or to 77, depending on 208, 233, or 463, has to measure 120. If we have a wild leg, which is a hot leg that measures double the amount of the other two, which is L2, L1, or L3 to ground, 200, that power will not work with the system. It may work, it may not, it's dirty power, okay? So any applications or contractors that are looking to throw this product into a building that's doing a rehab or a, a build out, we need to make sure that we check the voltage on site. And I mean, have a tech or have the contractor on site to check the voltage. It's a common problem, okay? It has to be clean power. What about phase checking rotation? Any clean power, nothing. Roll. It knows which way it needs to go. It's an inverter compressor. It'll make its phase changes in the unit. Inverter, rotary compressors, inverter scroll compressors can't run backwards. It's an inverter. If there's a phase, a lock rotor, a amp imbalance, a current draw that is over what the factory compressor has put into it, it won't even start at all. That's why Digital inverters are the future. We have less burnouts, as the slide showed earlier in the presentation. We don't just bang on, bang off, and we don't care and run backwards. It won't let it run if it's not okay. All six of the terminals are labeled as in the PowerPoint on the outdoor unit. A U1, U2 is our unit bus line where every single indoor unit in this system has to be in a daisy chain to the U1, U2. U1, U2 is on every indoor unit and it says to outdoor unit on the indoor unit. No splices, brakes, pull boxes, wire nuts, nothing. A solid pull, the only break is at the terminal block in the indoor where we add the next wire to the forward indoor unit. Okay, three and four is our upper level controller. It says central controller, whether it's a on-site BMS, touch screen, or our, our BAS BACnet 64 is landed on this bus. U5 and U6 goes to U5 and U6 on every system that has a follower outdoor unit. Basically, 
any system with more than one condenser, this wiring goes to the next one, and that's it. There's no addressing. You don't need to tell that you have three. You don't need to individually address any of the units. During the discovery and the startup process, it knows what's on its system. Quick little diagram. On the right, you see the U3 and U4, and you see U1 and U2. The reason you see that, guys, is because at factory ship with our product, the jumper wire between U1, U2, U3, U4 is disconnected. If we have a BAS, an upper level controller, a touch screen, this needs to be put together. But U3 and U4 don't do anything except for go from each system's header unit, one or seven, to this controller. Okay. So you see we have two systems on this diagram and U3 and U4 interconnect and it goes to a central controller in the dotted line up on the left where the thermostat or the central controller is, correct. U1 and U2 per system is daisy chained per its own individual indoor units, okay? U5 and U6 on system one, it's the interconnection wire between the header and the follower. Any header and follower don't need any wiring except for that U5, U6. That's it. Okay? No address. No other extra wire. You just daisy chain U5, U6 to 1, to 2, or 2 to 3. That's it. Okay? At the bottom, you see the one controller that takes care of the, four, the 3 and the one that takes care of the 1. Okay, that's a daisy chain on the thermostat. Okay, no different than the main bus line. Okay, so if you have multiple indoor units on one wall controller or one zone with four units and one controller, the thermostat needs to be daisy chained the same as the outdoor communication bus. The indoor units show every single A and B terminal on it. Everything on this system, guys, is labeled outdoor to indoor to central controller to BAS. Where it needs to go is where it needs to be landed. Okay. So if I find a U1, U2 on a thermostat bus, it, then it must not have had a sticker or something. So pretty simple. I would take a picture of this if you're interested or you're doing a system. This is the way it needs to be run. Okay. A and B, as it says in the green box, are non-polarity sensitive. They don't need shielded stranded wire as any BAS stat or any other stat would be, but the whole system in general needs that. So I don't see why you wouldn't run it. But we got Johnny out there running A to B all day, then I guess on the thermostat it won't be a problem. But I'll say this. If you hook up U1 red on the outdoor, then it better be red on every indoor. It's just common sense because the communication bus is polarity sensitive. And needs to be shielded. So the green wire can be regular thermostat wire in this case. Everything else needs to be shielded and follow these wiring stocks. Up to eight. So if you have an eight-ton outdoor and you got eight indoors and it's a church on a heat pump and you want one controller, whether it's in the room, whether it's upstairs in his office or it's downstairs in the basement, it's fine. We can run eight off of it because it's return air reading. Okay. The first unit on this schematic is the leader. Everything else only needs the daisy chain and nothing else. It's going to follow exactly what the header says it's going to do. Move on. This isn't a return style as some of the old lawn stuff or some of old BAS networks where we had to return it. Uh, you don't need to do it on this at all. 
last don't, unit in line. Don't do it. Yeah. yeah. You have 15 units, outdoor unit to number one, and it stops at 15 and we're done. Once we've got everything wired, piped, uh, we're gonna go through a pressure check process, leak test method. We have a two pipe system. Every indoor unit from the factory, as they say, comes wide open. Personally, I don't care. I like every single line, whether it's a two pipe or a three pipe, to be pressurized, pressurized excuse me, at the same time. Okay, so you see the manifold there on the, you want to go back? Sorry. So you see the manifold here with everything being pressurized at once. It's going to be the same thing on the evacuation that we'll show next, but we pull and pressurize from both lines on every system. Fifty, does it hold? 200 does it hold, 500, 24 hour minimum at 500. Today it's 45 out, tomorrow it's 75 out, or it's 25 out. We need to make sure that at the time of the pressurization of the system, we take the outdoor air temperature. We don't want to be chasing the rabbit down the hole thinking that there's a leak because I checked it on the day it was 65 out in the next 10 days or only. 26 okay this is a standard you know for the industry of what you can see based on outdoor temperature and pressure testing if you're worried about it let it sit another 24 hours vacuum method three pipe systems the heat recovery has the equalization line if you have more than one outdoor unit that will need to be pulled with the vacuum individually from the rest of the system unless you have a four pipe or a four hose manifold that does you know something else but standard procedure we pull vacuums from all lines not one we'll go through a couple of these uh Lately, we've had jobs that come up with smoke detectors for building security as far as shutting what down or what not down. Uh, we also have uh, issues where snow obviously here is heavy and it's a heat pump and it's spec is cooling only. Okay, so well, our lovely November 1st comes along, all boilers in the city or boilers wherever in effect. We're done with this system. Well, the boiler goes down. I have a backup, but I haven't turned it on in four weeks, three months, whenever it is. If I got a load of snow on this thing and I don't have the snowfall fan control that would normally be on there, that I could damage something. So we're gonna cover that. The only other one on here that we're gonna cover is, uh, you know, basically the uh, cooling priority or heating priority setting. And this is basically for a heat pump and a heat pump only. So that if we do not have an upper level controller and all call one call is a heat pump is hopefully spec engineered, designed and sold as that. If I have a cooling call come in or I have some weird call come in. And I'm not going to be uh, fighting my outdoor units for, you know, what am I going to do? You know, it's this, it's that, and I'm mixing back and forth. It's more of a redundancy and a safety precaution. But if we have applications that are heat pumps and that are designed and engineered as only cooling, we need to discuss this setting on startup. Any questions? We did get yeah. one from Operation and Air. What's that? I said we did just get a question from Tazo. Actually, he's got two questions in, in one box. Uh, said a manufacturer that he used to work with before allowed to pressure test at 600 
but with this is no more than 500 PSI. Is that correct? And then he, as a follow-up question, he asks, yeah, 600, never... 600, 600 PSI at 575, our system would trip on a high pressure. Okay. Uh, the internal relief, again, not okay with City of Chicago, why we have to add it, fusible link, which most contractors are aware of, is a temperature burst device. Pressurizing nitrogen at that high won't do anything with it. Uh, okay. It should be fine if you have or you have bought valves or shutoffs or ball valves. We need to make sure they're rated for 410 and they're rated for the pressure that you're discussing. Because I've seen ball valves not rated for 410 installed and they've pressurized it to 600 and we've had issues. So we need to make sure that the system outdoor unit from the factory is sealed. Your field installed piping should handle 700 based on factory piping, I guess, sale codes. It shouldn't be an issue. Awesome. You answered his yeah. first and his second question without me even reading the second question. So we're all caught up there. Okay. The valve needs to be right. Sweating valves in, uh, doing whatever to valves, okay? I, I, I can't do anything about a field installed device, okay? I love valves. If they're taking precautions and the proper raising is done on them, we shouldn't have any issues. That is a field installed device though. I can't say anything about a valve, but our system, again, 410A, anything is rated for 700. So the 600 is fine. I would say this, I wouldn't say if it's 624 hours, there'd be no reason for me to do anything else except for let the charge out and get the vacuum going. I wouldn't leave a standing or holding charge of that kind of pressure on anything. You don't know if the outside temperature tomorrow is going to jump 25 degrees, you know. Nitrogen is an inert gas, just the same. It's going to change. Uh, engineers and buildings that have this system in and it just is what it is. We don't have uh, BACnet. We don't have BAS. We don't have any kind of monitoring system. But I need to know if the system isn't an alarm. Uh, this is basically what this feature is. It's an accessory board uh, wired to the outdoor unit. Uh, two wires downstairs to a light or to a BAS uh, for a normally open, normally closed closure, however you want to set it up. And if the system goes into some type of, uh, I guess, non-running condition or a error, you'll get feedback. Local power supply, local, 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 you're going to see everything on this. Any kind of accessories as far as indoor unit uh, on-off switches. I need a smoke detector hooked up to an indoor unit. I have a uh, light sensor that I want to make a unit come on off about, number one needs to be discussed at the time of the submittal. Number two is an accessory, and number three has to have a field installed or a locally procured relay. We don't allow BAS or any kind of uh, management system other than what ours is to be tied directly into our uh, closures or our relays on our units. Uh, being that I'm a daisy chain application, if I have some kind of spike, I have seen multiple units be damaged from an outside source that wasn't isolated. So for jobs with control contractors on this call or this webinar or anybody concerned about that, it needs to be taken care of. Snowfall signal, we get weighed. It's basically saying, hey, it needs to come on. There you go. Again, the guys, this is more of an operation standpoint where it's a heat pump and it's not the main source or it's only cooling only or heaven forbid, like I say, the main heat supply for the building goes down and they just want to turn this on to make everybody happy. 
if we don't have this and we have a heavy snow load area or we have a install in an area where snow could compile on top of the outdoor unit, it might be a good idea to have this. Uh, this, if the city, local village, any uh, entity for safety on a call for fire, smoke, whatever it may be, wants to shut the whole system down, uh, they can use this if they want. Again, separation relay and whatever the fire people need to close a coil on or energize whatever to make the unit shut off is what would be needed, but we can supply this. This would be in the outdoor unit and it also would need to have wiring from the control contractor or the installing contractor ran to it. So this would be an extra wire that would need to be discussed or the conduit size properly to fit it. High static pressure shift, uh, indoor applications, dog houses or anything where the outdoor unit is not outdoors. This is something that needs to be discussed ahead of time. Kevin, I'll let you talk about this. Uh, would this be on a blueprint item? I guess it would be if we need to make sure that we have enough velocity to get the air out of the area, Fred. Yeah, there's certain guidelines that we'd pass along to whoever's laying the system out to sort of let them know how the ductwork needs to be designed, uh, specifically on the discharge. And, and you know how it also needs to how that area needs to be designed from like an, an incoming condenser air standpoint also so correct okay, so if we're choked off or we don't have any pull in then this could totally go out the roof correct yeah you'll definitely cause some issues if you have restrictions on the incoming side so maximum external static pressure on this guys you're seeing it point two that's nothing so we just need to make that known and we're looking at point one at ten thousand cfm can we ask a question here? Yes. Uh, Tesso asked, um, can we put a surge protector on this system? Base monitor or surge protector? He said surge protector, but I guess now that you said that, we have to answer both questions. <laughs> uh, any any phase uh, imbalance, any loss of line, any kind of main power supply to the outdoor unit, uh, dead drop, we're done. Not saying that the damage couldn't already have happened, uh, any kind of phase monitored outdoor surge protector, again, field installed device, whatever's leaving that device to the main power of my system is on the contractor that's installing it. Uh, but if it's an item that needs to be discussed, then we can definitely do that. I'll add on to that. Any kind of buildings that are having uh, VRF systems on an emergency generator, we definitely need to discuss that ahead of time. So, so you, you can use a surge protector with the unit you're saying? It's allowed. They can, yes. Uh, yes. As long as I get three phase rated voltage, no phase imbalance in the proper voltage of my outdoor unit, whatever the main power supply, line power supply is to my unit, whatever's in front of it, I can't say I care about, but my unit only looks at good voltage. So back to the wild leg. It may start, it may not run, it, it may not do anything. So on these applications where we're turning, you know, uh, old building into living quarters and we're gonna add VRF, we need to make sure that the building's power supply has been confirmed by everybody ahead of time. All right, I also wanna mention that we're at about 6.15 now. So we got about 15 minutes left. I mean, if we go over a couple of minutes, okay, but just wanna kind of help you guys gauge how much time we have. Perfect. And thank you, everybody, for the questions. I appreciate it. Uh, heat pump system changeover, being that a heat recovery, we can run both modes simultaneously. Here we cannot. We need to decide what kind of priority this system is. So if it is only a cooling only system, I would say at startup, we would set it for cooling priority. So the event that out of 30 indoor units, one, two, five people are Hold that day, call for heat, it's not going to affect anything. Okay, democratic mode is a voting system. Again, 
20 units, 10 and 10. It's going to take the most total of the most desired mode out of temperature and do that mode. It may be. The other mode will be standby. If every heating call that was democratically voted as the need is done and we go into cooling and then all of a sudden the voted mode is needed again, the lesser drops out and we move on to the next. Dictator mode is pretty specific. I'm in charge, I'm the head principal. I say it's cooling season, you don't get heat, and that's the end of it. Or we give them an upper level controller. These are the dip switches that you see here. That needs to be set at the time of startup, and this needs to be known at the time of startup. Guys, this really to me is something that needs to be discussed before it's either a heat recovery or heat pump bid, but we can discuss that if the job comes through. Consider heat recovery, as it says right there in the blue bold. Uh, I have a school with a heat pump, but they need heating and cooling, and it's a mess. The dean, the office manager, the president of the school has this in their office, and they lock everybody out of heating because it's time for cooling, and we just end the calls. All right, so you can do that with this device as well as any touch screen. 64, what's the next slide? I think it shows the next one, correct? Secondary heat option. Uh, we have boiler heat in the building and they wanna make it the main priority and we have a heat pump. This is what I need uh, to basically make it happen, whether it's gonna be primary VRF or secondary. Uh, the settings you see below are settable with the factory wall controller. If we have a job that has 24 volt interface or anything other than the factory controller, every single individual system will need to be hooked up at startup to change parameters to make it run like this is. Guys, it's time, it's money, it's other stuff that's not figured out. I just want to make it be known that if this is an application, we need to discuss it. This plug is an accessory plug. It doesn't come with the system. It needs to be known at the time of ordering or at the time of the submittal that this secondary heating needs to be used so we can make sure that we get you this plug. In the red box, guys, as I've said, it's a field procured. It's an external relay device that the contractor, control contractor, anybody but TC or carrier have to have installed to use this device. Another setting again with the factory wall controller is the only way to set it. It cannot be set with the back net controller or a touch screen. This is an individual unit that has to be set. All this is, is your heat shifting. When does the VRF come on? When does it turn off? When does the remote secondary heat start or not? Based on what's first, what's second, this is your, basically your line of your deltas that it's looking for. Okay, if you need any of that, let us know. We can send it over to you. Again, this is all factory programmed at the time of startup. So. We don't have this controller on site. We need to get it. Okay, secondary, basically the same thing. We need to pick all these and set these up. So again, time, time, time. We need to make sure that we have all this configured in the time, okay? Biggest point, and I know we're running low on time, but hey guys, if we're installing this, I need to know every piece of pipe, every length, everything in that system. County ceiling tiles, walk-in floor tiles, your arm link to your buddy across the room ain't gonna cut it, okay? Every piece of pipe size from our submittal never changes. Unless you move a unit, then it may. Other than that, if our submittal says 20 and you got 50, cross 20 out and write down 50. Pretty simple. That's 
basically what it needs to be. Every piece of pipe needs to be accounted for for a proper uh, refrigerant charge. Because again, no subcooling, no superheat, nothing can be done as it used to be with this system. Any last questions or? Yeah, I think we're pretty good wrapped up, so questions. Don't have any questions at the moment, unless anybody has any final ones they want to send in. They want my uh, phone number? 867-5309. I will say for everyone on the call, I mean, we do offer this class, not monthly, but at least probably four times a year, three or four times a year, where we're actually doing some hands-on work with the unit in our lab, as well as covering all of these install practices and go a little bit more detailed because we have more time. So if you're interested, obviously let us know. And you know, once the quarantine is lifted and the classes start again, we will definitely send you when the when the class is and how to sign up. I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, Greg, Kevin, Sal, you have anything else you guys want to add before we uh, wrap up here? I'm good to go. I'm good. Yes. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for uh, all chipping in and helping us get this topic out. And like Sal said, it's not as fun as when we do it hands-on, but at least we can still do something with you all. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good evening.